All right, hi, welcome back. We're going to talk about the last part of chapter 18, which is about development, um, uh, which is an application of what we've been talking about, regulation of gene expression. <clears throat> okay, so we'll go through some examples. Again, here's a little tip from Mr. Sanger. You know, don't worry about every single little detail. Uh, we'll focus on the big ideas. All right, I keep looking to the side because I'm on puppy duty, so I'll try not to get too distracted. Okay, so this is from your study guide, um, the last part about which page numbers we're doing and the topic. So if you're using your study guide, this is what this screencast is going to be about. All right, and this is about development. Okay, so this is a picture showing a tadpole, fertilized egg tadpole on the left, and then an actual tadpole on the right. And the question is, how does that happen, right? How does a single-celled animal turn into a zygote all right so in general cells are organized into tissues which are organized into organs the organs get organized into organ systems and then the whole organism okay and how this uh, pathway of development takes place happens at this at the level of the regulation of gene expression in each phase okay so the transformation of a zygote into a tadpole uh needs to have these three things happen we need to have cell division we need to have them differentiate in other words they need to change into the correct kind of cell and they need to get moved over to the right place in the body so that's morphogenesis all right cell division we've talked about um, this is mitosis mitosis is what is going to produce a lot of cells a large number of cells cells divide you get two, you get four, you get eight, et cetera. Um, so that's mitosis. But the problem is that if that's all that happened, you know, we'd have a big giant clump of cells that were undifferentiated, that didn't have jobs to do. They didn't so quote unquote know what their jobs were. It would just be a big clump of cells. Okay, so after cell division, those cells need to differentiate or take on their specific function or their role. So in the middle of that picture here, we see some stem cells, which are pluripotent stem cells, which means they have the potential to develop or to differentiate into multiple different cell types. Okay, so those stem cells have the potential to become muscle cells, you know, blood cells, liver cells, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And the word differentiation means the process by which that happens, okay, where cells become specialized in structure and function and then the question is like what's going on how can that happen how can this one kind of cell become all these different types all right uh that's the big idea um generally this is developed this is controlled uh primarily at the level of transcription so you learned about transcription where you know the dna gets transcribed into rna and then the rna becomes translated into proteins and so the control of how something like a stem cell gets turned into all those different cell types, that's controlled at the level of transcription primarily. So in different cells, there's going to be different proteins, which are going to have different effects on transcription, resulting in different cell fates. All right, so let's talk about two different kinds of factors that influence the fate of a cell. Uh, some of the cells that influence that are inside the cell. Those are called cytoplasmic determinants. And some other kinds of signals are outside the cell, and those are called inducers. Okay, so factors from the inside of the cell. This is a big, uh, the role of the egg is super important, okay, because there are things in the egg that influence which genes are going to get expressed in the egg, but then also after the egg has been fertilized. Okay, and what's kind of interesting is that those things in the egg are not spread out evenly. <clears throat> so in this picture on the right, you see an unfertilized egg cell, and those different shapes are supposed to symbolize different, two different things in the cytoplasm of that egg, which are called determinants. There's a red circle and a green triangle. All right, and Mr. Sperm comes along and fertilizes the egg, and now we have a zygote, and you can see that those green triangles and red circles are not evenly distributed in the fertilized egg, and then that undergoes cell division. And then on the bottom, we have that two-celled embryo, and clearly those cytoplasmic determinants were not 
evenly distributed into those two daughter cells of the two-celled embryo. Okay, so they're distributed unevenly. All right, so a genetically identical cells, they got the same uh, DNA. They have a different sets of mRNA, microRNAs, and proteins, okay? And this is going to have a big influence on what happens in each of those cell types or those two daughter cells. All right, here's one example of these sea urchin embryos. This is a picture of a sea urchin embryo at the eight cell stage. And what they found is that if they take a needle, as shown on the left, and they slice through the top layer, they take the top layer and it develops into nothing. They take the bottom layer and they've seen that that will develop into a smallish type sea urchin. So that's interesting. But if you slice it vertically um, on the right hand side, it's shown. The left side will develop into a normal sea urchin, and the right side will also develop into a normal sea urchin. So there's some, the point of this is that there's some cytoplasmic determinant that's present in some cells, but not in all cells that's going to cause differentiation, okay? The cytoplasmic material from the mother is not evenly distributed in the zygote, okay? And depending on which set of cytoplasmic determinants each cell gets, different things are gonna develop as a result of that. <clears throat> All right, so here is another example of a factor inside an egg, another kind of cytoplasmic determinant called microRNA. And I believe we've seen microRNAs before, um, but here's the picture on the right. Let me just explain this. Okay, here is a microRNA transcript. It's got a little loop on the end of it. This enzyme called Dicer comes along, cuts off the loop, and trims off these ends on the left-hand side. And now we have um, this new microRNA piece. Um, and so again, up here at step two, sorry, I had to do something. Um, we have this double-stranded microRNA. One of the strands gets degraded, leaving just this orange strand. And then this is in this protein complex. And then what happens is that if there's seven bases in that microRNA that are complementary to an mRNA, it'll bind. So the microRNA will bind to the mRNA, and then that gets tagged that way for destruction. So basically then that mRNA will get uh, degraded, and then whatever protein was supposed to be encoded by that mRNA is not going to get made. Okay, so that can happen at the level of the RNA getting degraded, the mRNA getting degraded, you know, or translation getting blocked. So uh, cytoplasmic distribution of these different microRNAs can differentially influence which cells get them, right? So there's an uneven distribution also of these microRNAs, and it's a way to control uh, what proteins are going to get made, okay? All right. Uh, and then let's talk about factors outside of the cell. Okay, these are called inducers, all right? And the process is called induction, all right? And then on this picture, on the bottom cell, I put a red box around these inducer molecules that are getting made by the cell on the bottom. They're getting produced. They're getting secreted through the plasma membrane of that cell. They're diffusing across to some other cell that's got a receptor for that inducer. And then they're getting taken into the nucleus to influence uh, transcription generally. So um, that would be similar to what we've seen with some hormone signaling molecules when we talked about signaling transduction. So uh, that would be something that's outside of the cell that's getting influenced and it's coming from someplace else and it's influencing that cell. All right. Um, and on this picture, it just shows you that if your not your cell, if a cell is receiving a lot of inducer molecules, so that's shown down here on the left, this top cell is producing the inducer, all those green circles are the signaling molecule or the inducer. The cell on the left has a lot of receptors and they're getting swamped up with this inducer. So there's gonna be a lot of effect on the transcription inside the nucleus of that cell. All right, transcription factor, you know, could stimulate, um, could be an enhancer protein, right? Enhance transcription off of that piece of DNA and end up making a lot of proteins. So if you have a lot of inducer molecules hitting your cell, that cell can make a lot of proteins, okay? On the other hand, if, you, if a certain cell is not receiving a lot of inducer, okay? Transcription of whatever gene is responding 
is not going to happen, right? So the transcription factors aren't going to be getting made. They won't be binding to the DNA, and they will not be influencing transcription of whatever that gene is to make whatever that protein is. Okay, so there's not much inducer, there's not much transcription factor, and that cell will have a different fate. All right, so the cells that have a lot of inducer will go have one fate. The cells that don't will end up with a different fate. Okay, so here's some examples. Okay, um, let's talk about muscle cell development. All right, this is a picture um, on the right hand side. Uh, okay, yeah, so we were talking about muscle cells. So this example of muscle cell uh, development. Um, muscle cells start out as precursors that could develop into a lot of different things. And then whatever certain environmental conditions will turn them into myoblasts and activate this master gene called myoD, it's called a master regulatory gene. Um, and then they have found this, uh, and it's a transcription factor. So this myoD transcription factor uh, present in muscle cells can activate a lot of different muscle-specific genes. So things like uh, myosin, uh, other muscle proteins, uh, muscle fibers um, can be activated by this myoD transcription factor. And myoD also activates its own transcription. So that's a positive feedback loop. Um, and it will also, so that will work to maintain uh, muscle differentiation because it's maintaining that myoD protein. Uh, okay, again, so this is just an example of a, of a factor inside a cell that's influencing differentiation or development of a certain cell type. All right, another example is in the lens of our eyeballs and in our livers. Okay, lens cells have a tissue-specific transcription factor, which will influence the transcription of lens cells, this crystalline gene. So this is shown over here on the right, okay? Uh, in the lens cell nucleus, certain activators are available, these orange ones, gray ones, and pink ones, uh, which will influence transcription of lens-specific genes like this crystalline gene. Okay, this albumin gene is also in that cell, okay, but those activators are not, they don't have binding sites on the albumin gene, so they will not be influenced by those lens-specific activators, okay? And then in the liver cell, uh, we have the red and gray and yellow activators in the liver cell, which are specific for some of these liver genes like albumin. So again, tissue-specific proteins are going to control development of different cells and tissue. So in the liver cell, there's liver-specific transcription factors controlling the expression of liver genes or proteins needed by the liver. And in the lens, there's lens-specific transcription factors you know, controlling production of proteins needed for the lens. So tissue specificity of proteins is a big way that development is controlled. All right, so let's talk about morphogenesis now. Uh, morphogenesis is once the proper cell has been differentiated, uh, it needs to be located in the correct place. So here's a picture of an adult fruit fly and of human embryo. So um, morphogenesis is just the process by which these cells and tissues get organized to build the whole organism. So one thing that's interesting in these fruit flies is that on the chromosome shown on the bottom, the genes are in the same order on the chromosome as the body parts in the body. So that's kind of cool. Um, we'll talk about that again in a second, but this all depends upon something called a morphogen which is an inducer that's going to diffuse from one group of cells to the other. And very often it forms a concentration gradient. Um, one popular or well accepted model of this is called the French flag analogy. So the French flag is red, white, and blue. And I can't remember the name of the person who came up with this model, but the differentiation of these cells into either blue cells, white cells, or red cells depends upon the concentration of a certain morphogen. So in this graph, we have concentration of morphogen on the y-axis, and then basically cell type along the bottom. So what you can see is that if there's a lot of morphogen, these cells develop into blue cells. 
Okay, they're not actually blue cells, but they're just a certain cell type will develop if there's a high concentration of morphogen. If there's kind of a medium concentration of this morphogen, the cell, a different cell type will develop. We'll call it the white cells. And if there's a low concentration of this morphogen, uh, blue cells will not develop and red cells will develop. Okay, so this is a concentration gradient of a morphogen differentially influencing uh, cell types. Okay, so that's again all said right here. Okay, um, so one example was if you have an mRNA mostly on one side of an egg as a cytoplasmic determinant, you know, there's going to be a higher concentration of that cytoplasmic determinant you know, influencing things on that part of the egg and not on the other part, okay? So things will develop based upon the concentration of different inducers or different morphogens, all right? Uh, and this works by activating or deactivating particular genes. So in these blue cells, let's say uh, the blue genes get turned on by a high concentration of this morphogen and the red genes might get turned off by a high concentration of the morphogen okay all right so here's an example of another how this is working this is called sonic hedgehog this is a super uh, actually it's a very famous and really uh, common um morphogen sonic hedgehog and it actually was named after the video game i think the video game is called sonic maybe it's called sonic hedgehog i'm not really sure okay but the concentration gradient of this morphogen determines in humans uh, what kind of fingers will develop. So in this picture here, um, the thumb uh, will form when that morphogen, sonic hedgehog, is super low. And the little pinky finger develops if there's a lot of sonic hedgehog. So the concentration gradient of that morphogen you know, directly influences how our, uh, how our extremities are developing. Okay. All right, so here's another example. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. Um, and normally, in order, this is a picture of a mouse paw, okay? Uh, it starts out kind of like a paddle, shown in this first picture. And then cells in between what end up being the fingers die. So apoptosis stands for programmed cell death, all right? And the way the fingers develop is that the cells in between there uh, die off, all right? and organelles get degraded, uh, cell parts get packaged up into vesicles, and they get cleaned up, all right? And this plays a really crucial role um, in development of different body parts and certainly our fingers. And when you don't have correct apoptosis, you know, you can end up with webbed fingers and toes, all right? Because the cells in between the toes are not properly dying off. All right, one more example of these homeotic genes, also known as Hox genes. And this is a big family of genes that control uh, development, morphogenic genes. And they control transcription factors that regulate development of each body part. So here's the gene. This particular gene is encoding this brown protein that's going to bind to a certain... Oh, this was worked out in Drosophila, actually, so in fruit flies. So in the fruit fly, this transcription factor will stimulate uh, antenna genes or turn on production of the antenna protein. A different Hox gene will turn on production of a leg gene. Okay, so again, these Hox genes have also been found in all sorts of different animals and they stimulate division of genes related to these different um, parts of the body. All right, and again, here's a picture of a fruit fly chromosome. And what's interesting is that the order of the genes on the chromosomes directly lines up with the order of the body part in the fly, all right? So each gene controls development of a certain body segment, all right? So that is kind of interesting, uh, all right? And if you mutate those genes, you know, what do you think is going to happen, right? Like if this brown one is the gene for the fly's head, these two brown ones say, determine development of the fly's head, or let's say these kind of, you know, orangish genes are responsible for the development of the wing, you know, and you mutate, you know exactly where that sequence is that controls development of the wing, and then you mutate it, or you change it, you know, you get some pretty funky looking flies, right? Here's a fly with a leg growing out instead of an antenna, 
and here's a fly with double wings okay so the fact that they were able to pinpoint exactly which part of the genome controls which body parts you know helps them you know learn all sorts of stuff okay uh and these are also found in humans all these hox genes many many other organisms all right and finding mutations in these genes has been really helpful in terms of understanding evolution uh okay so uh here's the big picture sentence right on this slide okay mutating some of those hox genes finding mutations in other genes have taught us that our cells contain all of the genetic information but it's how that genetic information is controlled in different cells that determines um you know the end product okay that regulates gene expression all right i believe that's it